commemorates the uh, entry of the Black Death into the United Kingdom in the port of Weymouth. Um, and you read this and you can't help wondering whether, you know, they couldn't have prevented it. If only they hadn't let that ship into the harbor, maybe millions of people would have been saved. But if it hadn't been that ship, then presumably some other ship in some other harbor would have brought in the deadly germ. And it's certainly not clear that they had the knowledge back then to do anything about this disaster. And it wasn't for lack of trying. Um, they tried everything they could think of in this desperate time. They tried self-flagellation, uh, uh, persecuting ethnic minorities, uh, tried and tested method that has failed every time. Uh, they even went after the cats, which uh, were thought to have some kind of compact with Satan. Uh, this was actually not just ineffective, but counterproductive as much as the cat population helped keep the rat population in check. Um, although some things they tried, although they didn't work, were kind of on the right track. Uh, and you could see over time uh, that we've gotten better and better at keeping people alive. And today is probably the safest time there has ever been to be alive. Uh, at least so far as small and medium scale disasters are concerned. And, and we can see this from statistics. So if you just plot survival curves, you see that today much fewer people die prematurely than in the past. This is the squaring of the survival curves. Um, this is a graph I love, which shows the uh, life expectancy in the best performing country in the world, which is a different country at different times. But you can see how steadily it has uh, kept going since 1840, improving at the rate of some three months uh, per year. Um, now, of course, uh, there is heavy investment in medical sciences and uh, in some fields like DNA uh, sequencing and synthesis, we have exponential progress. Uh, and we can hope that these advances will continue to make human life safer. But technologies like DNA synthesis and this uh, and other such biomedical technologies have often dual use. In addition to reducing risks, uh, they can also create new risks. DNA synthesis machines, for example, um, are machines that take as input some digital blueprint of the genome and some chemicals, and they put out uh, the actual DNA string. So with a machine like this, you can synthesize viruses from scratch. Uh, and this has been done. Uh, the 1918 flu virus, for example, was reconstituted uh, a couple of years ago. Um, and this is getting easier all the time. Initially it took the efforts of a large, well-funded lab working for a long time to do this. Uh, but in 10, 15, 20 years, capabilities like this will come into the hands of many. Uh, and you will be able to synthesize viruses like smallpox, uh, for example. The blueprint for that is already in the public domain, as is Ebola and many others. And more than that, you'll also be able to modify it, so you can tweak the smallpox virus. Um, researchers have done this with the mousepox virus, uh, um, by changing just one gene coding for interleukin-4, they could make the mousepox virus 100% uh, fatal for infected mice. Um, and a similar modification would probably work for humans. And this is a more general phenomenon. What we see is that uh, increasingly, the really big risks are shifting from the natural sphere over to the anthropogenic sphere. Uh, more and more of the really big risks arise out of human activities in some way. In particular, out of our growing technological capabilities. Um, this has been going on for some time. If we just look at the track record of past disasters, limiting ourselves here to some subset of those catastrophes that have killed more than 10 million people, we see that um, the majority of these are caused either by bad germs or by bad men. Um, there are a few famines in there, but for the most part they are linked to, to conflicts and therefore also attributable really to uh, bad men. But however horrible these disasters have been for the people immediately affected by them and for their families, um, if you 
zoom out and look at humanity from um, a long distance, as a great pond, and even the worst of these catastrophes have been like mere ripples on that pond. They haven't, in the final reckoning, substantially changed the overall amount of happiness and suffering there will ever have been. Um, uh, some of you might have seen this uh, diagram before. On the one hand, we can plot the scope, the magnitude of the population affected by some calamity. And it can go from personal affecting just one person to local, global, uh, affecting everybody around the world, to transgenerational affecting all future generations as well. On the other axis, we can plot intensity. How badly affected would each affected person be? And this can range from imperceptible all the way up to terminal. Um, and by terminal means something that is either death or something that would permanently and drastically destroy your future life prospects. So um, a fatal car crash might be an example of a personal terminal risk, but say a severe permanent brain injury or a lifetime imprisonment would be other examples of these kinds of terminal and personal risks. And, and up here, in the upper right corner, we have the global catastrophic risk, it's a vaguely defined category. Um, and all the examples I gave on the previous slides are of that sort, global catastrophic risks. But they don't fall into this uppermost, uh, rightmost box, the one marked with an X. That box uh, is the box of existential risk. And these would be transgenerational terminal catastrophes. Now, the good news is that there's never been an existential catastrophe. Um, <laughs> however, there are reasons for uh, taking the possibility of such an event seriously. Um, we know that more than 99%, <coughs> more than 99.9%, .9%, in fact, of all species that ever swum, flew, <laughs> crawled, or creeped on Earth are extinct. Um, uh, we know, or have reason to believe at least, that the human species itself was at one point teetering on the brink of extinction some 74,000 years ago. Um, the human population seems to have squeezed through a population bottleneck at that point, with just a few thousand surviving individuals. Um, at the same time, there was this big supervolcanic eruption, and it's believed, although not certainly known, that the volcanic eruption might have been causing this, um, this population bottleneck. We know that there are other intelligent species that have gone extinct. Uh, our close brethren, the Neanderthals, were with us until just some few tens of thousands of years ago, and they are gone. Um, there is some evidence suggesting that uh, another intelligent species, Homo florensis, the Hobbit man, uh, was uh, alive until even uh, more recently, although the fossil evidence is still a little bit unclear as to whether that was an intelligent species. Um, we can see on the horizon various specific existential risks, and uh, depending on when I run out of time, we might have the opportunity to look at some of those later. Um, and we can look at the opinions of various people who have expressed views on this matter. Um, there is a tabulation of, of some of these, and you really have to read the fine print to, to interpret these probability numbers. Um, we had a conference two years ago at Oxford on global catastrophic risks in, in general and asked the participants at the end of that um, what they thought the probability was of the overall risk of extinction prior to 2100 and the median probability there was 19%, um, which is, is alarmingly high. Um, it's possible that there is some selection effect uh, going on here, although these were academics, they were academics who had self-selected to go to a conference discussing global catastrophic risks, you're probably more likely to do that if you think that there are actually are significant global catastrophic risks. Um, one figure often quoted is Martin Rees's uh, assertion of 50%, but it's actually not the probability of human extinction, but it's the probability of civilization ending, which need not entail human uh, extinction. Um, his, his book is a little bit vague on that point, but that's what the 50% figure refers to. Um, notwithstanding, uh, there hasn't been all that much research on this topic. You think if it's fairly likely and hugely important that there would be a massive attempt to understand existential risks better. We tabulated uh, the amount of articles on uh, 
dung beetle and compare that 